Okay, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And uh, we're going to start reading verse number 7 and read down to verse number 15. And we're going to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in the world or the ministry of the Holy Ghost in the world. Uh, look at John chapter 16, verse number 7. And Jesus is speaking and he says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things the Father are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to be in the church house this morning. We thank you, God, for those that are joining us online as well. We pray, God, your blessings upon each and every one that hears the word of God today. I pray the Holy Spirit would do his work today in the hearts and lives of Christians and the hearts and lives of lost people today. And if somebody doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I pray, God, that they might come to know him before it's too late. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this morning I'm going to preach to you on the ministry of the Holy Ghost in the world. In the world. Um, he says in verse number 8, he says, When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's really going to be our text this morning. And um, man in his lost condition is naturally ignorant of spiritual things. Uh, when it comes to spiritual truth, men can be ignorant, they can be arrogant, or they can be lazy, or a combination of those things. And only the Holy Spirit can teach spiritual truth in reality. Uh, God does use human instruments to communicate his truth from the word of God to uh, those in the world today and uh, through the centuries and through the times ahead. He'll use men. He'll use uh, books. He'll use literature. But he'll use men that uh, the Holy Spirit of God is, uh, that are yielded to the Holy Spirit of God in order to get the message out. So the Holy Spirit is the one who is the communicator, but he communicates through people. Uh, the preacher and the Bible teacher and the soul winner, uh, they can preach the truth, but only the Spirit of God can really impart truth to somebody's heart and mind. If you ever witness to people sometimes, you'll sometimes you'll, you'll feel like there's a connection there, like they're getting it, like they're receiving it, like they're open to it, uh, they're receptive to it. And sometimes you witness to folks and it's like they're not getting it at all. It's like there's a wall there or else there's some kind of a barrier there, but for some reason they're not understanding it. And the Bible said faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So a person has to be somewhat familiar with the Bible to really understand the gospel. It doesn't mean they've got to be a Bible scholar. It doesn't mean they've got to have a degree or something. But it does mean they should have some familiarity with the Bible. And I'm still glad when I come across people today that have some familiarity with the Bible. Amen? Amen. I mean, the way that the news media and the television uh, uh, puts things out there in the shows and stuff, you would think that uh, nobody read the Bible but a buffoon. Amen? You wouldn't think that a smart man or woman would even take time to read a, a Bible or much less own a Bible. But uh, there's a lot of folks that do, and a lot of folks still have respect for the Word of God and some fear of God in America, and I'm glad to know that, amen? amen. But again, you watch television, you wouldn't know that. But you get out and you talk to real people, real people do believe in the Bible still, many of them, amen? Not all of them do, but most of them do, I think. And that's a blessing, but what I'm saying is this. A lot of folks don't get saved because they don't have any familiarity with the Bible. They don't know what it says. They don't have any background in it. They don't understand what you're talking about when you start quoting verses to them and things like that. That's why you've got to explain things to people. You can read, you can, I can, I can, I, for me, myself, as a preacher, I can preach something, and I can look out there and see if somebody's like not getting it, and then I've got to explain it a little bit more. That's my job is to explain it, Amen. Uh, it's not my job to, to judge you because you don't know it. It's my job to teach it to you. And your job and my job is not to be critical of people who don't know the Bible and aren't familiar with it. Our job is to get the message to them if they don't know it. Amen. Amen. 
That's where evangelism comes in, soul winning comes in, witnessing comes in, and that's also where the Spirit of God is interested in, amen? And the Spirit of God wants to use us to do that. Uh, the comforter he mentions here in this passage is uh, referring to the Spirit of God. Uh, if you look at chapter 14 and verse 26, he says this, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Look what he says in chapter 15, the same verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, I will send him unto you, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, and he shall testify of me. So the Comforter here is a reference to the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost, uh, as it's called in the Bible uh, both ways. Now, we're going to talk this morning about the ministry of the Holy Ghost in the world today. And uh, the ministry of the Holy Ghost in the church and the life of the believer is to comfort us. He's our comforter. But when it comes to unsaved people, the ministry of the Holy Ghost is not comforting, it's convicting. It's to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I'll say this, if a person walks into our church, they should feel welcome, amen? amen. Whether they're saved or lost, they should feel welcome when they walk in here. But when we start singing songs about the Lord, about salvation, and we start preaching the Bible, preaching the gospel, they still ought to feel welcome, but if they're not saved, they should feel a bit uncomfortable. Right. Why is that? Because they are out of place. They're not in Christ. They're not saved. They're in a place with a bunch of believers who believe the Bible and believe the gospel and try to live the best they can according to the Bible and the gospel. And a person comes in that's not saved is going to sense that. And they ought to sense that. Amen? Amen. They ought to sense that there's a difference between a saved person and a lost person. Amen. And that's what's wrong with much of this modern day evangelism on television and stuff is all these guys out there with their mega churches, many of them, they just assume everybody out there is saved. Amen? Hey, the apostle Paul never assumed everybody he wrote to was saved. Right. And the Bible here, he went after lost people in the church. Most people think, well, if you go to church, you must be a Christian, you must be a believer. That's not necessarily true. I'll guarantee if you've got a church full of 500 people, there's some lost people in there that need the gospel preached to them. You just can't assume everybody's saved. In the South, we just assume everybody's saved because we ask, are you saved? It's, oh, yeah, I'm saved. And then we stop right there. You need to go a little further. Well, how do you know you're saved? You get a little personal there, see? Well, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. How do you know that? Well, I've got the place now, I've got, a, I've got a way of when I try to talk to folks, because sometimes it's difficult to get past that barrier, I just, everybody assumes they're a Christian, so I just simply say this, I say, uh, do you consider yourself a Christian? Most people are going to say yes. Oh, well, then I've got something you would like to read. Before that, they wouldn't have done that. But now they've done, that they've done identify themselves as a believer. So you've got to take some Bible stuff from me now, otherwise... You just lied to me, right? And they don't want to admit that. And if they are deceived about their salvation and think they really are saved, they're still going to take it and they'll read it and maybe they will get saved Amen. and find that they were deceived. Amen? Our job is to be as wise as uh, 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 serpents and harmless as doves. Amen? And try to get the message to folks. But anyway, I want to talk to you this morning not about the ministry of the Holy Ghost in the life of believers, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world itself among lost people. Let me say, first of all, the Holy Ghost teaches the truth about sin. Teaches the truth about sin. I mean, one, one more thing I want to mention. Look at verse number uh, uh, 7. He said, when, he, when the Spirit of God comes, I'm sorry, verse 8, he says he'll reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What does reprove mean? The definition of the word reprove means to convict or to convince somebody of something. To convince them or convict them. And what the Holy Spirit of God does is he convinces you that you're lost he convicts you of your lost condition and your sin uh, so that you'll come to Christ as a guilty sinner to be forgiven. Amen? That's what he does. And so that word reprove, many times you've heard us talk about the Holy Spirit of God convicts people. Uh, we use that term, but that's really what reprove means. So if I say that, that's what we're talking about. So the Holy Spirit of God teaches the truth about sin, about the concept of sin. Look at verse number 9. He said the Holy Spirit's going to come and reprove the world of what? First of all, of sin, because they believe not on me. Let me say this. We're all sinners by nature. Amen. Every one of us is a natural born sinner, and we're a child of wrath that deserves the wrath of God, and we live our lives under God's wrath if we're not saved yet. Now, what does the Bible say about the concept of sin? Well, man is a sinner because of what he is. 
Man's a sinner because of what he is. What is man? He's a sinner. Therefore, he's a sinner. Amen. Uh, people think that man's a sinner because he lies, he che cheats, he steals, he curses, he kills, he robs. Uh, but that's not so. A man's not a sinner because of what he does. He does those things because he is a sinner, because that's his nature. He has a sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature within us. A uh, man's not a liar because he tells lies, but he tells lies because he's a liar at heart and by nature. A man's not a thief because he steals, but he steals because he's a thief at heart, and that's by nature. He's born that away. Jesus Christ said, Out of the heart proceed all these evil things. And uh, all those things come from the heart of man. Uh, one illustration I read goes like this. If you see a wormhole in your apple, don't worry. It doesn't mean the worm is in your apple. Amen? It means it was in your apple. So just cut around it and probably be all right. Amen? When he was a kid, probably, I remember I was a kid going to my uncle's house next door, and he had all kinds of apple trees in there. And most of them were rotten, but you go down there, you find a couple that look pretty good on the ground, but they had, you tell them, was, I thought their worms were in them, so we didn't eat them. Then we found out, no, the worm's not there, he's already gone. Amen. Amen? But the worm, what happens is when that, when that apple blossom blooms, is that's when uh, those worms uh, wind up there. They, they plant an egg there. And uh, so that apple grows around that, and that, uh, that worm grows within. Amen? The, grow, the, 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 the apple, that is, the worm is grown within the apple. He's a part of it. And then when the apple matures and stuff, then that apple, uh, that, that, that worm leaves and works his way out of that apple. And uh, you take, uh, you say, inside of man, uh, when man is conceived, he's conceived in sin. And the heart of every human being has a seed of sin in it that was planted there the moment you were conceived by your mother and father. Because we're all sinners, we pass on that sinful nature to our children. So children are born sinners because they got that seed of sin within them. And so as they grow up, what you see is when you see all this, the terrible twos, and you see, you know, the, you know these rebellious teenagers, and then you see these, uh, you know, uh, uh, adults that grow up and, uh, you know, they're living lives that, that aren't are contrary to the Word of God and things like that. What's happening there is that's the outworking of that sinful nature within them that's starting to work its way out. Didn't get into them, it's coming out of them. Um, and so we have sinful uh, civil nature within us, and it's going to blossom and bloom, and it's going to bear fruit of the works of the flesh as we get older. Uh, it just shows we're a sinner. Uh, you take, if you find a rabid dog on the loose, uh, that dog's going to be caught, and they're going to kill him, whether he's bitten anybody or not. You know why? Because of what he is. He's a rabid dog, and he's going to hurt somebody, and he's going to, he could possibly kill somebody. He's capable of doing some things and doing some real damage to people if he bites them. So what, the, what they do is they're going to go and take that dog, find that dog, and they're going to put him down because they can't cure him of it. And uh, you take a man is not a sinner because of what he's done but because of what he is. And as we grow up, if we don't keep that civil nature in check, what you're going to see is all hell break loose in society. And I think we've seen some of that this year, amen? Mm -hmm. We've seen it since, you know, since the dawn of man, really, since Adam sinned and and it was put out of the garden. There's been sin ever since. But it's very prevalent today. We just see more of it, I suppose. But in any case, um, if you don't believe in a sinful nature, I just tell you to do this. Don't even read your Bible. Just turn on the news tonight, amen, at 10 o'clock, and tell me you don't believe man has a sinful nature. Right. Because there's going to be people dead tonight in this town that's been killed and towns across this country. There's going to be people raped today. There's going to be people filing all kinds of reports on child abuse, and sex abuse, and theft, and robbery, and stealing, and, and uh, killing, and uh, beating people up, and aggravated assault. You know why? Because men are sinners. Right. Women are sinners. That's why we live in a sinful world, man. And that's the proof of it. Uh, God looks at man, and he sees his heart. And he sees the sin that man's capable of. And man is condemned because of what he is, not what he's done. That's why a man can't fix himself and religion can't save him. Amen? He needs a new birth. He needs to be born again. Uh, when the lost man sees that he's done wrong or been doing wrong and he begins to feel guilty about it, he'll try to reform himself. He'll try to better himself. He'll try to improve himself. He'll quit drinking. He'll quit doing his dope. He'll quit cussing. He'll quit carousing around. And uh, 
He, he, he doesn't know yet that the problem is not the outside, the problem is the inside. Because you can quit all that stuff and still you're going to be a sinner, amen? Now if you quit all that stuff, more power to you, thank God you did that, amen? But that's not what saves you. It just shows you that you're a sinner. And on the inside, you're still going to realize that. Um, if you go down to the woods and cut down a tree and take it to the sawmill and put it on a table saw, you cut it down to a four-sided piece of lumber and you make a four-by-four four out of it. On the outside, it looks perfectly straight and square. But then you get down to the end of it and you look at it and you see that it might be a little bit crooked. You might get the straightest one on the on the uh, there at the at the lumber store and still look at it, and you can see you can see the inside of it, and inside it's all crooked. You look at a man on the outside; he may look straight and square on the outside, but you know what? You look inside of him. You see that heart's deceitful of all things and desperately wicked, and it is corrupt and it is crooked. What man's problem is? He's got a crooked heart. You know, nobody's completely honest. Nobody's never going to not lie to you. Probably not. Maybe some people won't. There's some people that won't. They won't lie to you. Um, and I'm not lying to you either, amen? But some folks aren't going to lie to you. Now, you got to ask, you ask yourself, first of all, though, when you ask somebody a question, are you lying to me? Tell me the truth. You better be sure you want the truth. <laughs> amen? There's some things I don't really want to know. Amen? But, uh, but the fact is, man is corrupt. He's wicked. He's got a heart that's desperately wicked, and it's deceitful. It'll deceive you into thinking that you're okay when you're not. Uh, that's why you've got to take the Bible, look at it, and see what the Bible says about you, amen, and see what the God says about you. And when you do that, then the Holy Spirit will convict you that you are corrupt on the inside, and that you're not all you are cracked up to be and professed to be, amen. A person can quit all his known sins and claim to be as straight and square and uh, perfect as a person can be and yet still be lost. A drunkard can quit drinking and still not be saved and he can go to hell sober. Um, you take somebody who can be a doper and quit doing his dope because he found out that you know, it's not, it doesn't pay to be a, a dope head. He can quit all that stuff and he can go to, uh, go to hell you know, with, a, you know, with a clear mind if he doesn't get saved. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, morality can keep you out of jail, but it cannot keep you out of hell. Amen. Because why? Because we're still sinners. We're still immoral on the inside, no matter what the outside may say. You take, the most, you take who you think the best person that you've ever known in life is, inside they're a sinner. And if they're an honest sinner, they'll admit that they are a sinner. Amen? Right. That doesn't mean that they're out doing vile things, but it does know that they do know what they are on the inside. They're a sinner before God. So the, the lost world, they try to redefine sin. They try to explain it away. Um, the evolutionist says man needs more time. The environmentalist says the man needs a better atmosphere. And the educator said man needs more knowledge. And they don't know what they're talking about, amen? There's some things you can't fix. Uh, you can't fix your sinful nature. You can't fix what's wrong with you. Only God can do that. Um, the Minnesota Crime Commission report on juvenile delinquency said this, every baby starts life as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toys, his uncle's watch, or whatever. Deny him these, and he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murders if he were not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, if given free reign to their impulsive actions to satisfy every one of them, every child will grow up to be a criminal. What I just read you is 100% politically incorrect in the year 2020. But everybody that deals with kids and criminals knows it's true. We live in an age where you can't admit the truth. It may be true, but you can't say it because it's going to offend somebody. I mean, my little precious little angel here, you're saying that they could grow up to be a criminal if, uh, yes. If you don't tramp in the ways of God, they certainly could wind up as a criminal. Uh, and that's where they come from. Uh, so you got the kids have got to come up right. They've got to be raised right, amen? And if they're not raised right, then you're going to have a child that's going to wreak uh, havoc on society. 
But uh, man is a sinner. The concept of sin is that man is a sinner because of what he is. Not only that, but man is a sinner because of what he does. So you are a sinner because of what you are, and you also are a sinner because of what you do. A man does what he does because of what he is. Romans 3.10 says this, There's none righteous, no, not one. No, not even me, not even you, amen. Not even the best person you know. Matter of fact, the Bible said there's not a just man upon the face of the earth that sinneth not and doeth good. Right. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means me, that means you, amen. We're all sinners. We've all committed sin. Uh, our human nature is a poison well, and the sins that we commit are the poison and the bitter waters that come out of that well. Whether you sin in thought, word, or deed, you and I are sinners nonetheless. In God's sight, the thought of sin itself is a sin. Jesus said that lust is adultery. Hatred is murder. God destroyed an entire civilization, the Bible says, because the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. That's back in the book of Genesis chapter 6 where the flood hit. Um... One man wrote a book years ago in the 1950s. He was a psychiatrist. And the title of his book was, Whatever Happened to Sin? Whatever Happened to Sin? And his, his point was is that there is no sin anymore. Nobody's a sinner. Nobody does wrong. That's in the 1950s they're starting this stuff. And he recognized that you know, the concept of sin was very important to human behavior because you got to admit that, you know, we're all sinners. We're all born that way. We're not born good. We're born bad. Um, but whatever happened to sin? Well, the world has redefined sin out of existence. Abortion used to mean infanticide, the killing of a baby. But they softened it by saying now that we're just simply pro-choice and we're for productive, reproductive rights, reproductive freedom, and so on and so forth. So forth. But abortion is still the taking of a human life. It's still murder. Now, personally, I believe this. I believe that in the case of rape, incest, uh, or the life of the mother, I'm okay. You make up your mind about that. Maybe you disagree with that. But that is a very minor part of the abortion world. 98% right. of the people that abort children do it because they don't want the child, and it's an inconvenience to them. It's going to hurt their career. I mean, we've got Fleetwood Mac because Stevie Nicks had an abortion, amen? Mm How -hmm. many read that recently? She said, just think if I didn't have that. Well, we, we would have missed Fleetwood Mac, I guess. <laughs> we would have never known that we missed them because we never heard of them, amen? But she sacrificed that child on the uh, altar of her success. Well, she did for her career, for her career. I wouldn't brag about that. I wouldn't be bragging about that. But in any case, uh, they rename sin. They redefine sin so that it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, lust is called adult entertainment. Uh, fornication is said to be, is called just being sexually active. Adultery is called having an affair. A prostitute, the Bible is called a whore. Uh, her client's called a whoremonger. Uh, an alcoholic in the Bible is a drunkard. That's just what the Bible says about it. But the world calls it different things, amen? Calls it different things. They call one sin an alternate lifestyle. Well, it's a death style is what it is. But in any case, uh, man tries to downplay sin and make excuses for the sins of the world. And everybody has his faults. They say everybody makes mistakes. Uh, and everything like that. So, you know, everybody does it, and so we shouldn't get too upset about it. But when somebody sins against you, uh, and it touches your heart and your life and your family, then you know it's bad, amen? Then you believe in sin, amen? Uh, some people don't believe until it touches them. But the fact is man is a sinner because of what he is, man's a sinner because of what he does, and man is a sinner because of what he's not done. Uh, this is the primary sin that the Holy Spirit of God convicts men of. They convict, the Holy Spirit of God convicts men of rejecting Christ. Look what he says in verse 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit of God's primary work of conviction is to show a man that he's lost and unsaved because he's rejected Christ and not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. So man's a sinner because of what he's not done. 
uh, consider the seriousness of this sin. And that is the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and not believing on Him. Uh, this particular sin is really a clenched fist in the face of God. It's refusing to bow the knee before your Creator and your Maker. And it's high treason against the King of Heaven. It's rebellion uh, against God's government. And when you recognize that you've refused and rejected and spurned and ignored the one who made you and died for you, then you understand this son of unbelief is a terrible, terrible sin. Matter of fact, it's the damning sin. You know what damns a man to sin? It's not his drinking, it's not his drugging, it's not his cussing, it's not his fornicating, it's not his, good, his bad thoughts. What damns a man to hell is rejecting the Savior and the remedy for his sin. When you reject Christ, that's the one that damns you. No rock and roller is going to hell because of his lifestyle. He's going to hell because he rejected Jesus Christ. No politician is going to hell because he was corrupt and cheated the government and, and all the people that trusted him. He's going to hell because he rejects Jesus Christ. Um, so it's rejecting Christ and not believing on him. John 3.18, the Bible says this, He that believeth on him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned, not way down the road, not in eternity. He's condemned already, right now, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's present tense, right now. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, right now. An unsaved person who's not trusted Christ as Savior, the wrath of God is hanging over their head right now. Yep. And they're in danger of being lost forever. Mm -hmm. Unbelief is the parent sin from which all other sins come. In the garden, Adam and Eve sinned because they did not believe what God said. Uh, a courtroom can, can, can convict you of your crimes. Uh, your conscience can convict you of wrongdoing. But only the Spirit of God can convict you of your sins before God. And the Holy Spirit has to convict you of that, and He will. Uh, when the Spirit of God convicts you of your sin, you'll no longer be strutting on your way to hell thinking you're too good to be damned. Uh, when the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of your sin and rejects the one who died for you in agony and blood upon that old rugged cross, you're going to be led to cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. Amen. That's what happens when you get convicted by the Spirit of God. You come to the Lord for salvation. So what does the Spirit of God do in the world? What's His ministry? To teach the truth about sin. Secondly, to teach the truth about righteousness. In verse 10, He said this. He said, not only of sin, verse 9, but of righteousness in verse 10. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So He says here, the Spirit of God's ministry is to convict the world of sin. And nextly, righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness is where the completion of salvation comes in. Salvation was completed because Jesus Christ was righteous and he died on the cross for sinners in their place. Amen? Uh, Jesus Christ left his Father's house. He left the ivory palaces of heaven. He entered this world of woe. He took upon himself the form of a man. He lived a sinless, a perfect, a virtuous life. He went to the death of the cross for you and me. He then spent three days in the stone-cold tomb. And then on that third and glorious day, the Bible tells us he arose from the dead. And then he went to the tabernacle in heaven and offered his precious blood upon the mercy seat to atone for our sins. Amen. That's what the Lord did. That was his ministry when he died and rose again from the grave. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And then, then he ascended to the Father. And that is what Jesus meant when he said that he went to the Father here. His resurrection and his ascension are proof that God accepted his sacrifice at Calvary. And that the righteousness it takes into heaven can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again from the dead. And then ascended back to the Father in heaven. Look what he said in verse number 10 again. He's come to convict the world, reprove the world of righteousness because I go to my Father. Well... The resurrection is no doubt there, but he goes to the Father. That's not just the resurrection. That's beyond the resurrection. That's the ascension. That's when he goes to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven and takes his rightful place there in heaven, in the tabernacle of heaven, amen, where he, de where he deposits that blood on that altar for our sake. Now, the average person thinks that he's a sinner because of what he does wrong. The average person thinks he's righteous if he does what's right. 
The average person thinks that righteousness comes from doing good and being good. And the only way you get to heaven is by being the best you can, being perfect, being the goodest you can get, amen? The problem is you've started too late because you've already got your past life of sins that you've already committed that you can't make up for. There's still a debt to be paid for your sin. If you start living right, according to the Bible, 100% without sin from this day forward, you still got to worry about the past sins you've committed. They haven't been wiped clean by your goodness and your, by being a good person. Uh, but uh, let me say this. Romans chapter 10 and verse 3 says this. It says that uh, Paul was talking about his own people, the Jewish people, and he said about them, he said, he said they go about to establish their own righteousness. That's self-righteousness. Being ignorant of God's righteousness. A person who's trying to establish their own righteousness, self-righteousness, personal righteousness to get into heaven, they're ignorant of something. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. And what is God's righteousness? It's a person. It's a man. It's Jesus Christ, God's Son. He is our righteousness. Amen. And apart from Him, we can't get to heaven. So you can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. Amen. And uh, you take Isaiah 64 verse 6 says that uh, all our righteousnesses, all the best things that we could do are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Uh, there's only one way into heaven, and you can't get there by presenting the filthy rags of a leprous sinner to God and expecting him to accept that in your behalf. He's not going to do that because we're sinners. Now, you can be sincere but sincerely wrong, as I said. There's only one way to heaven. And that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you and I on the cross. Amen. If salvation could come any other way than the cross, then Calvary was the greatest blunder of the ages, the greatest mistake God ever made. Uh, Calvary's not an option. Galatians 2 and verse 21, Paul said this. He said, if righteousness come by the law, that's keeping the law and doing good, he said, then Christ died in vain. He said, if you can get saved by being good, if you can get saved by keeping the law, if you can get saved by keeping the Ten Commandments, then why did Jesus die for? Right. He died to save you, but if that can save you, Jesus didn't have to die. He didn't have to suffer for us. So we say this, if you can earn salvation, then why did Jesus die? Well, he died for sinners to save them, because sinners can't save themselves. Amen. That's right. why. Uh, so again, Calvary's not an option for heaven. Uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers said this. He said, the worst form of badness is human goodness when human goodness becomes a substitute for the new birth. Because what you're doing is you're rejecting God's remedy and God's solution for your sin and your predicament because you think you're smarter than God. You think you're better than Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the problem. Um... The Holy Spirit will convict you of being a sinner because you rejected Jesus Christ and have not believed on him. Verse number, uh, verse number uh, 9, of sin because they believe not on me. And verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father. There's the ascension. Again, the fact that God accepted his death and burial and resurrection on our behalf is proven by the fact that he was able to ascend back to the Father. God accepted his payment on Calvary for us. So the Holy Spirit of God will convince you that the only way to be saved from your sin and from hell is by receiving His Son, Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior. And when you do receive Christ as your personal Savior, then God will deal with you as you are, as a sinner, as a child of God by nature, and He'll born you again, regenerate you, and give you a new nature that's sinless. Amen? Amen. Now that sinless nature within you doesn't make you sinless. When we get saved, we still got that old sinful nature. But he puts a sinless nature within us. That's the Holy Spirit of God. And now we've got that conflict there between doing right and doing wrong. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead us in the paths of righteousness. Amen. He's going to lead us in the right way of life. Amen. We become partakers of the divine nature. And he says Christians aren't just nice people. They're not just good people. Uh, they're born again people. They're people that have been regenerated by the Spirit of God and born again by faith in Christ. They're new people in Christ. They're new creatures in Christ. So God changes you uh, by giving you a new nature, a sinless nature. He forgives you of what you've done. All your sins are washed away, thank God, in the blood of Jesus Christ. Every spot, every stain, every sin. And He gives us what we need, and that is the true righteousness. 
to get us to heaven. The Bible calls it imputed righteousness. How many has ever heard of imputed righteousness? Imputed righteousness. Paul talks about that in the, God, in, the, in the book of Romans. And what he's talking about is this. When God imputes righteousness, see what he does this. He takes, the, he takes the righteousness of somebody else, Jesus Christ, and he imputes it or credits it to your account. Amen. And he takes your sin and lays all your iniquity on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ bears your sin and he gives you his righteousness. So when God looks at you, he sees somebody that's in God's sight because of the blood of Christ. He sees you in Christ as Christ. Amen. And he sees you sinless before him even though you're not. And he declares you not guilty, Amen. even though you are. Right. That's called justification. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, that God hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we trade our sin for his righteousness by faith. Uh, Romans 4, 5, and 6 tells us there that uh, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So God counts your faith in God, his son for your righteousness. You're not righteous in yourself. Your righteousness is his filthy rags, but his righteousness is the true righteousness, the perfect righteousness, and that's what you need to get to heaven. Why? Because there's none righteous, no one, and no unrighteous thing can enter heaven. So God's got to fix you. And what he does is, the Son bears our sins upon his own body on the cross. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then he takes his righteousness and gives it to us as a gift. It's called the gift of righteousness. So that God declares us righteous in his sight. And not guilty of any sin in his sight. That's how it works. In the courts of heaven. Amen. So Jesus takes my sin, I take his righteousness. That's the deal. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, You stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if he were you. So, in other words, salvation is like Jesus steps into my shoes, and I step into his shoes. We traded places. Isn't that a blessing that's salvation, amen? amen? Now, let me say finally this. The Holy Ghost of God, His ministry is to teach the truth about um, sin, the truth about righteousness, and the truth about judgment. Look at verse number 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Notice what he says. He said, the Holy Spirit of God is going to convict or reprove the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment, verse 8. And then he delineates them in verse 9, 10, and 11 and gives you a little explanation. So the Spirit of God teaches the truth about judgment. And the truth about judgment is that Satan and his subjects have been condemned. Uh, of judgment, he says, because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is Satan. He's the devil. God's arch enemy. Uh, the prince of this world system is Satan. Uh, the devil, the god of this world, and the Lord Jesus Christ said that he is judged. He says this before he ever goes to the cross. Jesus didn't say, when I go to the cross, he'll be judged. He said, he's judged right now. Right. I'm not even gone to the cross yet. I haven't died and resurrected yet. But you know what? His days are numbered. He's, he's done for. Amen. The devil is done for. As far as I'm concerned, he is judged. In the mind of God, Satan's defeat, his doom, his damnation is a foregone conclusion. And Satan causes a lost cause. Uh, he sails a sinking ship and he's ruling over a doomed kingdom. His destiny is an eternal lake of fire, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. So, really, Satan is a loser. He's a loser, amen? He's already lost. He lost at Calvary. Now, hell was created, Jesus tells us, for the devil and his angels. And it wasn't designed or created for the souls of men. Back when you look at the, you look at where Jesus spoke in Matthew twenty five, he said, uh, "Depart from me, you cursed." He's talking to lost people. He says, "Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for who? The devil and his angels." So if you go to hell, you're not going to a place that was made for you. That place is not for you. That environment was created for the devil and his angels. 
So you'll be out of your element. You'll be out of God's will in your, in your life if you go there. God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, uh, he says there that hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for the souls of men. So all lost sinners who die and go to hell, they are intruders into the devil's domain. Now, the devil doesn't rule hell. He'll be suffering in hell just as much as anybody else, and no doubt more so. But when you get there, there's not going to be a welcoming committee welcoming you to hell. They're not glad you're there. I mean, hell is the penitentiary of the universe. And when you walk through the gates of a prison, guess what? You're not welcome there. The guards don't want you. The other inmates don't want you. Nobody there wants you there. You're in a place that you don't, that you don't belong. It wasn't made for you, really, uh, because you're made to live, you were made to do right. If you do wrong, you wind up there. You're going to a place you don't, you don't really belong. Uh, well, if you die and go to hell, you're going to a place where you definitely don't belong. You definitely don't belong there, and you definitely will not be welcome. All your friends are not going to be there waiting on you, rejoicing that you just arrived. Amen? It's not that way. That one Bible sticker we had, I uh, saw it, maybe in the back someplace, it said the, he said the, it said the party in hell has been canceled due to the fire. Amen? There is no fun in hell. Amen? Amen. Um, let me say this. The world itself has also been judged at Calvary. That is, those who follow the devil, those who are children of the devil, those who are unsaved, Satan's subjects, they've been judged. John 12 and verse 31, you can look at that if you like, John 12 and verse 31, and uh, Jesus said this, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Uh, he says there not only is Satan judged, but the world is judged. The world is judged. What is the world? The world is the world of lost people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The world that God died for is lost people. He didn't die for saved people. He died for lost people so they could be saved. Amen? Amen. Um, now is the judgment of this world. Salvation is in the cross of Calvary. And he mentions that in the context we just didn't look at. It. He says, if I be lifted up, he said, I'll draw men unto me, is what he said. Amen. He's talking about the cross. So salvation is in the cross of Calvary, but the cross not only saves people, but it also condemns. It condemns all those who reject it. Every person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior is a part of this world that Satan rules over, and God has judged this world. And he judged it at Calvary. Those who have never received Christ as Savior are not children of a heavenly father, but they're children of a hellish father. They're children of the devil, according to the Bible. And their destiny will be the same as their hellish father, which is a place called hell. If a person dies without receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, then the Bible teaches they'll spend eternity in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. The Bible tells us that the, that the lost who rejected Christ are condemned already and they'll be judged when the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom. And the Bible says it's appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So there's no second chances after you die. There's no reprieve, there's no pardon, there's no salvation available if you die as a lost man or woman who's never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the way God has it designed. Now, you say, well, I don't understand that. I don't understand why God would do it that way. He didn't do it the other way, and I could have thought different ways and do it. Well, I tell you, you can discuss that with God when you stand before the bar of God in heaven, and he'll explain it to you. Amen? But God's pretty much explained it very explicitly in the Word of God we have right now. Amen? It's very clear. The problem is we're sinners. The problem is we don't have any righteousness of our own. The problem is you can't get to heaven without righteousness. So you've got to somehow get rid of the sin problem, and you've got to receive the righteousness from somebody else that's good enough to get you to heaven. And that other person is Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you receive Christ as your Savior, guess what you receive? You receive His righteousness. You also receive His eternal life. When you receive Christ, man, I tell you, you, you you've, uh, you've hit the jackpot, man. Amen. Spiritually, when you receive Christ as your Savior, amen, everything He has becomes yours. But if you reject Him as Savior then you're going to have to spend eternity paying for the sins you committed when you didn't have to do that. 
God's not willing that any should perish. That's why he sent his son. But he wants all men to come to repentance and faith in his son, Jesus Christ, so they can be saved. God made it as easy as possible. I mean, what, is, what could be simpler than just simply saying, you know what, Lord, I am a sinner. I don't have the righteousness to get to heaven. I know Jesus Christ died for me and shed his blood to pay for my sin. I know I need his righteousness to get to heaven. So, Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to let you have my sin. Let Christ bear it for me, and I'm going to take his righteousness by faith. What is so difficult about that? But you know what? When it comes right down to it, the devil and your own pride is like, you know, there's something there that's just keeping you and preventing you from coming to Christ. Well, the Spirit of God is convicting you. He's reproving you. He's trying to convince you the right thing to do is admit your guilt and then throw yourself on the mercy of God's court, receive Christ as Savior, and it's going to be okay. Amen? Amen. It'll be okay. And you'll be saved and forgiven. Father Him, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the opportunity we've had to come to church today and Lord, fellowship around Jesus Christ and His Word and with His people today. We pray, God, that uh, those who have heard the message today, those that are saved, those that are Christians, that God, this might strengthen their faith, encourage them, Lord, educate them in the, the doctrine of salvation and how, how it applies to them and what it really means. And Father, for those who are not saved, those who are not sure of where they're going when they die, Maybe they're listening and they're not sure they're, they would go to heaven when they died. Maybe they know they would go to hell if they died. But Father, whoever it might be that's under conviction right now, we pray the Spirit of God will continue to work in their heart and their life and bring them to a place of faith and repentance in Jesus Christ that they might be saved and born again, have eternal life, and know what it is to be a true Christian. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to turn on a little uh, music here for our invitation. We'll stand for prayer. And we'll close here in just a few more moments. You need to pray. This altar's open. I invite you to use it.